Hello and welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 313. Today, we're talking about the terms, the places, dojo, dojang, where they come from, what they mean, and all kinds of other stuff. This is going to be a little bit of a history lesson, cultural discussion, and some other stuff. It's not going to be just rattling off definitions. But before we get to that, my name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick. I'm your host for this show, and you can find all of our other episodes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can find everything we do from our projects to our products at whistlekick.com. We're on Amazon. We might even be in your dojo or dojang because we do offer wholesale accounts. And we have customers who buy stuff because they are kind enough. They see what we're doing. They value this movement that we're trying to usher in, to bring traditional martial arts to its proper place in the world. And they support us financially. You can support us financially, but you can also support us by sharing this show. I don't talk about that often. If you help other traditional martial artists find this show, it gives us a bigger platform. And with that bigger platform, we can attract bigger guests. We can have bigger conversations and we can continue our movement to bring traditional martial arts to everyone. Because as I've said before, there is nothing else that you can do for, say, six months that will have as big of an impact on your life as traditional martial arts. With these Thursday shows, I do try to mix it up. And today we have this wonderful write-up from one of our team members on the dojo and the dojang give you a little bit of knowledge, history. We could test you at the end. This would, this would feel like a, a good kind of book report project, but that's not what we're going to do. There's no price of admission. There's no test. It's just for sharing knowledge. The Japanese term dojo, or place of the way, is commonly known as a specialized place of training, especially in martial arts. Traditionally, this is the place where people enhance their skills and train seriously with discipline. The term is also used by some meditation practitioners, including Zen Buddhists, though a more specific term, Zendo, is more commonly used. In Japan, the term dojo is used for any facility that is dedicated for physical training of any discipline. In Western countries, dojo is used solely for Japanese martial arts, judo, karate, kendo, etc. A dojo is not just an ordinary facility. Etiquette is important, like kneeling, bowing, and the way we move around in the dojo. There are quite a few house rules that differ slightly from one martial art to another or dojo to dojo. For example, one of the common practices is to make a standing bow when entering or leaving the dojo as a sign of respect and humility. Unnecessary talking during practice is generally prohibited and this is not a place for socializing, so staying on the mat or the floor without practicing is often prohibited. In many schools, the students have the responsibility of cleaning the dojo whenever they train. Overall, the rules incorporate discipline and respect towards each other. However, the implementation of these rules differs from one dojo to another. Some modern dojos don't strictly implement the rules, and the original practices are often neglected. A dojo is not just a place for enhancing physical abilities and techniques. Since the traditional use of dojo is for training Japanese martial arts, the principles of these martial arts are carried over to the definition of dojo. For example, judo teaches courtesy and gentleness, and Shotokan Karate teaches that practitioners should be, quote, constantly mindful, diligent, and resourceful in your pursuit of the way. And that is a quote, of course, from the founder of Shotokan, Kitchen Funakoshi. Therefore, it can be said that a dojo is a place where we diligently improve ourselves to be a better person and to be beneficial to society. Not just a place to be an expert martial artist. It's a place where morality and good manners are practiced and honed. There are no design rules in constructing a dojo, so dojo appearances vary from one another. In terms of layout, however, traditional dojos have shomen, which means front, and may have different entrances based on rank. There is also the kamiza, place of honor, that is reserved for the most prominent people. The kamiza is located farthest from the entrance. 
The opposite of kamiza is shimoza, bottom seat, where the students enter. There is also kamidana, god shelf, that is located at the back of the kamiza that contains the shinto kami, the spirits. The kamidana is always set up above the eye level and should not be located above an entrance. The weapons rack, if any, is also placed as part of the kamidana. On the right side, facing forward, is where joseki is located. This is where the more senior students and instructors bow in. Opposite the joseki is the shimoseki, where the lower rank students bow in. There's also a place for putting shoes that is located near the entrance. Yeah. Typical custom in that part of the world. Now, of course, your martial arts school might be laid out different. Even if you practice karate or judo, you may have a very different layout. I'll be very honest. Most of the martial arts schools I've trained in, the Japanese schools, do not follow these rules. In fact, I'm going to guess that most traditional Japanese schools in the U.S. don't know about these formalities. And that's okay. If you do, that's great. If you follow these practices, I think that's really cool. As we are putting this together... I learned something, and that's part of why we're doing these episodes. Hopefully, you learned something. Modern dojos, on the other hand, offer more features for the convenience of the students. For example, lockers for shoes, clothes, and personal belongings, drinking water and cups. Some even offer shower rooms. And hot weather isn't an issue because the entire dojo might be air conditioned. Now, features aside, it is important that there is ample space for moving, and the ceiling has to be high enough to avoid damaging it. The flooring can have mats that will serve as a cushion to avoid serious injuries, or it can be just a wooden floor, which is my preference. Some martial arts, such as judo, require thicker mats, of course, because the entire body is thrown down. Traditional dojos have only tatami flooring, the bamboo straw mats, but most modern dojos use mats made of foam or rubber that provide more cushion and shock absorption. Let's compare and contrast dojo with dojang. In Korea, the counterpart of the Japanese dojo is dojang. Do means the way, just as it does in Japanese, while shang means a place. So it can be translated to place of the way, just like dojo. A dojang is also a training hall where Korean martial arts are practiced, including taekwondo, hapkido, taekyon. Etiquette is also observed in a dojang, and examples can include at the beginning of a class, the students will line up according to rank. As in most Japanese martial arts, the highest ranked student will give a series of commands from do re, meaning face the flags, to mokyum, meaning meditate. Students are prohibited from making unnecessary noise, like talking, unless they're instructed. Shoes, food, and drink are also prohibited inside the training area. And to maintain order, proper chain of command must be observed. Lower ranked students must first ask their immediate senior and not approach the head instructor directly. You know, that's a, here's a sidebar. That's a rule that I remember from my early days of karate that was not enforced, but we were made aware of it. And it's one that I have to say, I haven't observed in Taekwondo. That feels like one of the, the rules that has likely faded the most. The idea that you're not prohibited to approach the instructor unless you're one of the, the, the few that are directly ranked under them that you're supposed to look to your immediate seniors for help. And I can see both sides as to the benefit there. But anyway, all members must be addressed by their last names, including children. That's something I've seen in a lot of Taekwondo schools. And it was weird when I first saw it. Advanced techniques must not be asked unless the student has already mastered the patterns or the techniques that he or she is currently working on. Uniforms must be kept clean and pressed. And just like a dojo, a dojang must be kept clean because it is a sacred place for learning the, quote, way of the martial arts. Now, I suspect if you are a practitioner of Korean martial arts, you were nodding along as we talked about the dojo, the Japanese stuff at the beginning. If you're a Japanese martial arts practitioner, you are likely nodding along as we're talking about dojang. The two places and practices are pretty similar. Of course, that's no surprise because of the history of Taekwondo and its origins in karate. 
The term dojang must not be used interchangeably for gym, however. The gym in Korean is called cheokguan, where all sorts of sports can be played. If a gym has a dojang, then only that place where martial arts are practiced can be called a dojang. Now, of course, terminology, the way we use words, to me, the intent matters more than anything else. I know plenty of folks who refer to their taekwondo training space as a gym because it's a term that is understood here in the United States. If we start calling things a dojang, that's a term that not everyone knows. And it's okay. It's not necessarily meant with disrespect. And to me, as long as something is said with the intention of disrespect, or at least the lack of disrespect, it's all good. Some martial arts styles have their own headquarters, usually located where they were initially founded. It's also called Hanbu Dojo, because the headquarters also serves as the central training facility. Some of the Hanbu Dojos in Japan include the Aikido World Headquarters, or Aikikai Hanbu Dojo, which was established by the founder of Aikido, Morahai Yoshiba, in April of 1931. It's a five-story building located in Shinjuku-ku, Tokyo, and it has around 250 mats. The Kodokan Judo Institute, which we talked about a little bit during our episode on Jigoro Kano, was established by... Jigoro Kano, the founder of Jiro, in May of 1882. And it's an eight-story building located in Bunkyoku, Tokyo, with 1,200 mats. The Japan Karate Association, JKA, or Nihon Karate Kyokai, was established by Gichin Furukoshi, Iso Obada, Masatoshi Nakayama, and Hidetaka Nishiyama. And it's a four-story building located in the same town, Bunkyoku, Tokyo. Actually, I'll be honest. I don't know if that's a town or a province. I neglected to look that up. Noma Dojo, which is the Kendo Hanbu, was established by Noma Seiji in 1925 and located same place, Bunkyoku. Oh, Tokyo. Yeah, there we go. Looks like a town in Tokyo. Or a section of Tokyo. I apologize. This feels disrespectful. A lack of research on my part. But we're going to move on because it was not intended as disrespect. Ha. According to the website dojos.info, there are more than 20,000 dojos in the U.S. as of 2014. The state with the most is California, with more than 10% of that 2,600, and the state with the highest density, the most dojos per capita, is South Carolina, with 33,786 people per dojo. Hmm. You know what? I strongly question that number. I think, we, I think we've got far more people, far more dojos per, per person in most states. I mean, certainly we have more than that in Vermont. Can you tell I don't do the research myself? I get a report and I look through it and I edit it and I report it to you. And so I'm learning almost at the same time that you are. And I think that's fun. We're on the same page. We're in this together couple trivia facts for you. Did you know the first karate dojo in the United States was opened in 1945 by, here's a name you've heard before on the show, Robert Trias, a martial arts pioneer for sure, and one of the first American black belts. The oldest judo dojo in the United States is in Seattle, Washington, and that was established before 1907. So we're going a ways back. And it was pioneered by Lataro Kono. Actually, that's probably Itaro Kono. I hope you learned something today. I hope that your knowledge of Japanese, of Korean martial arts was enhanced even just a little bit. For those of you that practice martial arts from other countries, I bet you saw a lot of similar stuff. The the practice, the discipline, the militarism that is rooted in traditional martial arts carries through to pretty much every martial art the world over. There are a few exceptions, capoeira being the major one, but there are still practices of discipline and respect. And that's one of the things that I love about traditional martial arts. And it's one of the things that we can all share is our love for that personal practice that leads to growth. If you want to read a transcript of this or check out the show notes or photos or any of the other episodes, head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you never have before, I would love for you to check out the site. 
And if you have, why don't you head over and leave a review, whether that's at iTunes or Stitcher or somewhere else. Did you know that we have an app for both iOS and Android? They're free. Little bit customized experience. It's going to make downloading, watching, listening, everything that we do a little bit cleaner, a little bit easier than the general podcast apps you may be using if you're on the road. So go ahead, check those out. It's just Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio on the the Google Play Store or in the iTunes Store. That's all I've got for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.